Our topic for this session will be viscous trauma, and we'll begin with a case of adrenal hemorrhage. When you consider the relative value of the adrenal vessels, right and left, arteries and veins, as indicators of abdominal trauma, the right adrenal or suprarenal veins are the winners. They are the shortest uh, and they are the thinnest walled, making them the most susceptible to shear injury in a group of vessels particularly prone to that type of injury in the first place. You see here a thin rim of leaking contrast material outlining a slightly hyperdense, ill-defined suprarenal mass. There is also a small focus of venous extravasation the right adrenal gland, venous drainage, is through small branches that flow into the right inferior phrenic or right renal vein. This most likely is a branch leading to the inferior phrenic or even the inferior phrenic itself. That hyperdense fluid extends down around the kidney, which certainly makes sense given that the right adrenal gland and right kidney both reside within the right perinephric fascia. You can see a second rim of fluid is in the perinephric space proper, and that can be visualized crossing the midline and even up against the aorta, showing that it is on the outer aspect of the right perinephric fascia. Here is that mass outlined by leaking contrast and fluid extending down around the entirety of the right kidney. On the coronal view, you can really appreciate the suprarenal mass-like appearance of this hemorrhage outlined again by leaking contrast material. See the displacement of the right kidney. So that is a case of right adrenal venous hemorrhage. Our next case is a hepatic laceration. This is a subtle, linear, fine hypodensity extending from one vascular structure to another here within the right liver lobe. I caution you to keep an eye out for these by extending between normal structures like this. These lacerations have a tendency to mimic the appearance of a fissure that uh, looks for all the world as though it should in fact be there. Note also the lack of perihepatic fluid, so your eye would not necessarily be called to this abnormality. There is, however, stranding and fluid density in and around the right adrenal gland, indicating injury to that structure, and heightening your vigilance in your search for intraperitoneal injuries. In addition, farther down, we had, of course, transverse process and soft tissue stranding injuries. Let's look first at the hepatic laceration. Note it extends from the IVC to the portal vein without significant stranding or perihepatic fluid. Next, let's look at that adrenal gland. There is some hypodensity within the substance of the adrenal and surrounding it, consistent with a vascular injury. So that is a case of a hepatic laceration. Our next case, is an extensive subcapsular hemorrhage involving the right liver lobe. You see along the raw surface of the liver, there is extravasation taking on somewhat the appearance of a brush fire. There is an intervening hypodense region full of clot and fluid, and then there is a small focus of extravasation or active contrast leakage on the outer aspect of the liver capsule. This is for the most part a contained subcapsular hemorrhage, although you can see there is hyperdense fluid within the peritoneum, suggesting that some of this hemorrhage has broken through 
the distended and expanded liver capsule. Right there, you see the focus of extravasation extending beyond the liver capsule. And again, note that raw surface of exposed liver parenchyma. So that is a large hepatic subcapsular hemorrhage with intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Our next case is a traumatic hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. You can see here in the portal region, there is a small focus of extravasation and significant stranding. There is a geographic hypodensity involving the left liver lobe in the region supplied by the left hepatic artery. You can appreciate that interface right here along this green line. Again, appreciate the bilobed pseudoaneurysm in the gastrohepatic region with inferior and superior moieties. Both are originating from the portal region at that small focus of extravasation. Let's look now at a magnified view of the involved vessels. You can see here we are looking at the common hepatic artery. If we go just inferior to that, you can see the origin of the gastroduodenal artery, beyond which we now have proper hepatic artery, which then branches into right and left hepatic arteries. The extravasation is originating right here from the left hepatic artery, thus leading to reduced arterial perfusion of the left liver lobe. So that is an interesting case of a left hepatic artery laceration with resultant pseudoaneurysm and reduced arterial perfusion of the left liver lobe. Next, we have a case of a splenic pseudoaneurysm. I like this case, though, as it allows me to demonstrate another pseudoaneurysm and an interesting spine injury as well. You can see there is widening of the facet joints here in the upper thoracic spine, and on the soft tissue windows, you can appreciate an irregular venous extravasation arising from the posterior aspect of the azagous arch, a venous pseudoaneurysm, in exactly the location you might expect for a flexion injury occurring at this upper thoracic level. In the abdomen, we have another pseudoaneurysm, this one of the spleen. Pseudoaneurysms of the spleen tend to form on the hilar aspect where the vessels are larger, and they can be a bit of a management problem. Obviously, this is ready to blow at any point. There are adjacent lacerations of the splenic parenchyma, and there is a significant amount of perisplenic fluid. There you can appreciate the widening of the facet joints in the upper thoracic spine. And the small focus of venous pseudoaneurysm arising from the posterior aspect of the azagous arch. Here in the abdomen on the hilar aspect, the splenic pseudoaneurysm, and extensive splenic lacerations. So, a case of azagous and splenic pseudoaneurysms. Our next case is another splenic laceration. Early splenic enhancement can be very heterogeneous. We are all familiar with the Moiré effect and a variety of other alterations in splenic homogeneity that can be physiologic. But this is too much heterogeneity and a little too much hyperdense contrast, uh, too irregularly distributed throughout the spleen. 
This is a shear injury of an intraparenchymal laceration. Note again, as with many of the lacerations we've seen this talk, there is a distinct absence of perisplenic fluid. You can see it extends in a vaguely linear fashion all throughout the central portion of the spleen. It's the post-contrast views that are particularly disturbing here. There is the slightest hypodensity visible in the most superior aspect of the spleen, as we'll see on the cine. But essentially, that abnormal appearance of the splenic parenchyma has resolved on these post-contrast images. Note again the absence of perisplenic fluid, other than the tiniest bit of stranding at its inferior aspect. And there's superiorly, note the tiniest bit of hypodensity that might have called your attention to this, but a pretty tough call. So that is a splenic laceration. Our next case is a pancreatic laceration. There is a good deal of intraperitoneal fluid, and there is retroperitoneal fluid, specifically in the anterior pararenal space consistent with a pancreas injury. The pancreatic tail is markedly enlarged and hypodense, and there is a complex linear network of hypodensities within the parenchyma consistent with a laceration. Another view shows us intraperitoneal, retroperitoneal fluid, and the linear pancreatic parenchymal laceration. On the cine, appreciate first the parenchymal laceration, the hypodense enlarged pancreatic tail. This region is typical of bicycle wrecks, which is actually what this patient was. Now appreciate the anterior pararenal space fluid, which respects the more posterior perinephric space and which does not involve the perivascular portion of the perinephric space. This is confined as it should be in an isolated pancreatic laceration. Contrast that case with this next pancreatic laceration. We see again a linear hypodensity, this time within the body of the pancreas, consistent with a laceration. But in this case, there is hyperdense fluid more posteriorly located in the retroperitoneum. You see it, it's, it lies against the aorta, meaning it is in the central portion of the perinephric space. More inferiorly, you can appreciate the typical, more hypodense, anterior pararenal space fluid you would expect with a pancreatic laceration. But distinct from it, and again lying in the perinephric space, is hyperdense fluid up against the aorta due to this aortic laceration. Note the left perinephric fat remains clean that's because there is, in addition, a left perinephric fascia, which in this case has not been violated. So we'll look first at the pancreatic laceration. Then at the hypodense anterior pararenal space fluid, typical of a pancreatic laceration. Now let's look at the periaortic hyperdense fluid in the perinephric space. And lastly, follow that aortic contour and you can see it wink at you in a focal laceration. So that is an important case of a pancreatic laceration which may very well have disguised an aortic laceration. And that concludes this session on viscous trauma.